Welcome, Scott. I, I, the funny thing about Scott, I was working at Puppet Labs as an engineer. I used to work in financial services, running Puppet in production. I became an open source contributor. I gave a talk at, Docker, or at Puppet Conf in 2012. And I didn't know that I was there doing an interview. And after the conference, they gave me this offer. And you know, when you go to a conference and you work for some enterprise, like, like they pay for your flight and hotel. And I came back to the office, like, how was it, Kelsey? I was like, it was great. And I'm quitting. <laughs> <laughs> and I went to go work at Puppet Labs. And this was the you, first. You were at a customer at the time, too. I was a customer. So we had to be very careful. You got to be that careful. One, right? They were fine with it. We just made them feel cool. We sent them some t shirts, some free books. <laughs> and I'm joining this company. So I'm a software engineer working at Puppet Labs. And I'm trying to figure out, like, how does Puppet make money? And Scott, I remember pairing with you, and you were like, hey, we're running a business here. We can be honest and true to our community, and we can still do the right thing by our customers. And that word customers, the difference between a project and a product. And before going to Doc, I remember years go by, I'm gone, and we meet in a bar. You're like, Kelsey, I'm looking to switch things up. What should I do? I said, Scott, forget what you read. Just go to Docker. He's like, Docker, huh? I was like, yeah, don't even think about it. And you joined the Docker team. Tell people a little well, bit about that. And it was, it was um, seeded by, a, so Puppet um, was there with Kelsey heading marketing and product. And Puppet was paying attention to the, the PaaS space. Because had PaaS taken off, this is engineer at Heroku and .cloud, would have impacted Puppet's business. So we see .cloud open source this thing called Docker in March 2013. And we're like, OK, not quite sure what that is. Three months later, it starts showing up in the Puppet accounts. And people who were users of Puppet started switching their workloads and started switching their activities to Docker. I'm like, what's this all about? Got my hands on it. It's like, Ooh, this is going to change things. About that time, I had a, a beer with uh, Kelsey in a bar. And he's like, yeah, 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 it's a thing. It's like, yeah, it's a thing. So, uh, joined Docker shortly after that in February 2014. So look, 2014, Solomon's still there. Yep. Yep. Docker. 20 of us. So it's open source, 20 open source engineers, Solomon and myself, and Ben Golub, the CEO at the time. So very small team. Docker's on this rocket ship. I'm at CoreOS at the time. Docker's changing the game. It was the first time that I ever seen in my entire 20 plus year career where a startup was dictating the terms of the big guys. Azure was rethinking things. Google was rethinking things. The company that invented the concept of containerization was taking roadmap strategy from the startup. So you're on this rocket ship. Yeah, it was, it was an incredible time for the community because all those characters and more were all in one room, whether physical or virtual, trying to hammer out where this is going. And what was, I think, exciting, and all credit to Solomon, the founder, who combined three technologies that were out there but not integrated into a single experience. And so it combined the, the hardcore Linux kernel C groups and namespaces, which is really what brought the, the isolation properties to containers. It combined copy and write file systems to make the container immutable and thus portable. And then it combined um, to get semantics to make it approachable to technical professionals. So the Docker push, Docker pull, Docker, like all that is very intentional to be able to appeal to a technical audience. And Solomon, to his credit, brought all three of that together. So it's like, OK, great, taken off. What goes, what happens now? And Google is there, has experience running things at scale, massive scale. And the next thing we start talking about is, is orchestration. OK, you need to orchestrate these containers across multiple servers automatically. Otherwise, you're just going to get run over. So it's a very rich time in the ecosystem where multiple layers of the stack were being sorted out. And so Google brought Kubernetes. We brought Swarm. That was a thing for a couple of years. Um, but the core runtime, the core abstraction between the app inside the container and the infrastructure outside it, that's sustained. Here we are 11 years later. And that is still not just for Linux apps. It's now grown to encapsulate Windows apps. It's grown to encapsulate WASM. All of uh, Amazon Lambda, sorry, 30 some percent of Amazon Lambdas are now Docker container images. And we're seeing now LLMs be packaged as container images. So that abstraction just really works um, uh, it, from a framing standpoint in the heads of technical professionals, whether they're operations or apps or, or devs. So there's a part two I want to rewind for a second. So we talk about this late stage. So a lot of founders, people building these businesses, one of the hardest things to do is to get that second wave of employees, that group of professional product people, marketing people, sales people, and bring them in a way that they don't clash. Yeah. Yeah. Like you step into this arena, I'm pretty sure there was lots of opportunities. <laughs> 
How, short, how do you how do you slide in that when their vision and roadmap is that they want to go take over orchestration? Remember, there's Docker Enterprise, yeah. right? There's this vision that hey, maybe we're a cloud provider again. How do you look at that and navigate to a more I don't want to say a pragmatic roadmap that's really back at the core like you're describing. Yeah, and that took some school of hard knocks, honestly, right? So we took a run, Kelsey's referring to, we, we went hard at the ops market. So if you think of the SDLC left to right, we went hard at the operator and those that run lots of applications at scale in data centers or in clouds. Turns out, pretty crowded space. Also turns out our open source tech, we put a lot in the open source and Others were able to take that open source and make a lot of money on it by hosting it in the cloud. And so, long story short, we realized that's a saturated market. That's a really tough market to make a business in. And so in 2019, we stood back, sold off that business completely. Really, really painful to restructure a company. Um, unfortunately, said goodbye to 360 friends and colleagues, sold off 600 customers, sold off the commercial product, Docker Enterprise, and stood back and said, let's get back to fundamentals. Let's get back to the root of what Docker does, and, it, and that is for developers. So we pivoted to focus hard on developers in November, November 13th, 2019. So Two look, days you, from you make this hard product decision, the, the, the money maker, the thing, the answer to how we're going to make money, you decide that that's not the game. We don't want to be in the orchestration space. We're not here to compete with Kubernetes. Right. But underneath that, there's still something, the original vision, this thing for developers. We were making it simpler for developers all along. And yet we didn't see, in, in the run up to 2019, we didn't see like, okay, how can you make a business out of that? But we could see, um, despite all the drama around orchestration layers and such, we could see continued consumption by developers of desktop and container images, because it just makes things so simple for them. And so we said, all right, if, if that is where the pull is coming from, let's pivot and focus on that and really get into the minds of developers and figure out a business, not just additional open source and free, free things, but a business around that. Now, I remember this thing I, I, I had probably advised probably about a year before this happened. It was like, we're going to start charging for Docker desktop, a thing that was once free. You got to go tell the community that we not only plan to add a lot of value going forward, there's a roadmap now to this area that we're going to focus. And this is on the backs of the news of getting rid of Docker Enterprise and saying, you got to start paying. I remember we, we went, spent a long time on the FAQ. Yeah. Thinking about months that. and months and months. Yeah. So how so? How do you tell? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people want to be in this situation. If you have an open source project, and you have to go and have that conversation with your community, then now we got to start paying. How does that go? And what was the results of that? Yeah. And maybe I'll, I'll start with um, backing up a sec. It, it does show the importance of being super intentional with where you draw lines around open source and commercial value. And so if you are a founder, if you're an entrepreneur in the audience, or you're thinking about becoming a founder. Um, figuring it out later is a really risky place to put your company. Um, we figured it out, but I'll say there's a, sh a high degree of luck and timing that allowed us to figure it out. So being intentional with like, okay, who, who does not pay for free stuff in an organization? Who pays for value in an organization upfront as part of your open source and product investments? Spend time on that. Spend time on that. You can avoid a lot, a lot of drama and heartache downstream from there. So, so to Kelsey's question, we were just super intentional with our communication to the community that there's no single person in the community, right? There's not just a developer and that, that's representative of 100% of the community. We realized within that community, there are developers that work for organizations, work for enterprises, that pay for support, that need commercial features that developers don't necessarily care about, but their security organizations, their ops organizations, they really care about. And so, and Kelsey was a fantastic partner along with a lot of folks from our community to help us really be authentic in, in our communications. We're like, this is why we're starting to charge. Oh, by the way, if you're a startup, if you're a small scale company, if you don't have these enterprise issues, you don't have to pay. We were very clear that like, if you're just getting going and these features that we're commercializing aren't relevant to you, don't pay, right? In fact, we have 17 million registered devs today. Most of them do not pay. We have just under 2 million who are registered devs and who are paying because they work for these large organizations. Yeah, I hear so. that number? 2 million, and they're qualified to use this term called customer. Customer. And so that, that was a, a very, very intentional and deliberate. And look, not everyone's going to be happy. When you have tens of millions of users and you start to charge for a thing that previously was free, you're not going to get 100% people happy with that. 
But I will say the vast majority understood why we were doing it, understood that we were going to use those proceeds to reinvest in the product, and we did. And they could see the subsequent releases, just the product getting better and better, both the free product as well as the commercial product. And so very quickly, folks said, like, you know what, this makes a lot of sense. The third thing that, that worked is if you look at what we were charging for the desktop suite of, of products, and you did an ROI around what developers spend in terms of their time of day, the, the ROI on it was just obvious for decision makers. It's like, do I want to have my developers building an open source stack and maintaining and tracking upstream and tracking CVEs, or do I want them building applications for my business? And at you know, $24 a seat a month, the ROI was just obvious for the decision makers. Could you explain a little bit, because there's a lot of first time founders, a lot of people that don't know how to do that mathematical calculation. Some people say, look at all the GitHub stars, there's downloads, you're obviously using it. I know what the value is because I built it. How do you go and then assess the value in a way that you then use that to dictate the pricing? Like, what is the motion? Is you sending a UX team out, watching the way people work? You're sending out surveys? What's the brass tax here? But this is a room of founders or, or, or aspiring yeah. founders. Like, you go, you go, you know, don't send your UX team, don't do a survey. You go and talk to the customers. And at, at the end of the day, if you're going to build a product that's going to be sold into a, a business, it's sold into an enterprise, um, stating the obvious, right? They're paying hundreds of thousands of dollars per developer for their developers. And so if you're able to show how much time you're saving those developers with your product, the ROI becomes just, just really straightforward and really obvious. And so that's the calculation. How many developers? How do you, what's your average? What, what average salary do you pay them? How much are they blocked by this problem that you're solving on a daily basis, monthly basis, weekly basis? Oh, wow, what if we could make that go away? What if your developers were shipping 10 times faster? What if they were shipping 50 times faster? It becomes a super engaging conversation with the customer. But to Kelsey's point, you go and have that conversation. Do not send your, your UX team or your survey team. I work with a lot of founders that are very afraid to give out six-figure quotes for the stuff that they built. Think about that. You're going to go tell a company you want $100,000 a year for this product let alone the seven figure, one million dollars. How do you arrive to this calculation? I believe it's a similar model. People start asking for things like features and integrations. You say, well, if you had to go hire two of the caliber engineers you have, how much is that total comp, right? And that can end up at 500K quickly. And so then it becomes a deal when you're starting to quote these six and seven figure skew numbers to them because it, it just starts to make sense. So if you've been trying to figure out how do you get to those type of numbers, that's part of the formula. I mean, real back of envelope, just real time, right? So the, the back of envelope we had was for a, 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 a company to do this on their own, instead of paying us a subscription, for a company to do this on, on their own, it took five, four or five really good engineers, not, not just walk off the street, but like really good engineers who understood open source, who understood Mac and Windows internals and file systems maintaining all this open source stack, tracking upstream, five engineers pencils out when fully loaded with insurance and everything else, pencils out to about a million a year. So in exchange for a million a year, do you want to pay Docker a subscription? It became a very straightforward conversation. I want to pivot a little bit because a lot of people love working with founder-led companies. They feel like they're getting direct source to the vision. When you ask questions like, why does this thing exist? Where is it going next? And I've noticed that when you're working with product teams and you're talking about roadmap, you've done some acquisitions over time and you've been very careful about preserving what Docker is, but also doing something interesting, what Docker should be. And I step back and remind myself sometimes like, man, you're still moving like people expect a founder to do. What's that component and how important, or did you even think about that when you slide into the CEO role? Very generous. Thanks, Kelsey. Look, I mean, whether you're an entrepreneur or aspiring startup entrepreneur, like, you, you, you obsess about the thing. And you love, you love the thing as you're iterating through it. And so um, I didn't have this explicit conversation with myself, but I just I could see in talking with the users, talking with the customers, I could see how much they loved it were getting value of it. My own hands-on experience, they don't let me touch production code anymore, which is for the better. Um, but my own hands-on experience just brought so much time back in my own day to day. I just, I just loved the problem we were solving and I loved how we were going about solving it. So for me, it wasn't like, oh, I have to act like a founder. It's just, I just, I just loved it. I loved what we were doing and I could, I could love the impact it was having on our users and our customers. And so um, when, they asked, when the board asked me to step in as CEO, 
that wasn't a question. It's like, I love this problem space. I love these users. I love what we can do for them. Yeah, let's go, let's go figure this out. Let's go build a business around this. You know what's unique to KubeCon? A lot of us are, a lot of these products are coming from communities. When I went to go work for Puppet Labs, I remember going to my first Puppet Conf, the little small satellite conferences around config management. And I remember giving this talk, and it was the first time someone asked to take a picture. I was like, of who? <laughs> of what? <laughs> And they're like, hey, the stuff you work on supports my livelihood. And so I'm getting a direct feedback. Like if you are an engineer and you write code for a big enterprise, you hardly ever get to interact with the downstream customer that they recognize you to tell you about the code you wrote for them and how it impacts them. But in a lot of the things that we build as technologists, you sometimes get interaction with the actual customer. Docker has something phenomenal. I don't know if you've ever been to like the OG Docker cons. I remember going to my first Docker con, it felt like a rock concert. People had the t-shirts, and y'all even had this community thing. The Docker captains is still a thing. And that Docker captains represented an extreme sense of belonging. Maybe talk a little bit about how important community was into this whole business, right? What well, was and is, no, it's a fantastic, fantastic um, surface area. So exactly to your point, we, we have, hundreds of Docker captains, hundreds of uh, meetup organizers, and many of them are building services business, consulting businesses, training businesses. They built them on Docker, and that's what they do full time. And so they're out there, obviously there's some self-interest, but they started by just loving the engagement, loving the back and forth, because they would learn from the audience, the audience would learn from them, and then they, you know, a, a, a switch flipped and like, oh, I could actually make a business out of this and grow from there. And you, you, we hear stories of how Docker uh, enabled someone to, you know, a laptop in, in a far off country to actually build a business on their own, right? And we hear stories about how Docker is used by uh, data scientists in, at, at uh, medical research facilities to actually be used in analyzing data from cancer clinical trials, cancer medication clinical trials. And it's actually speeding the results, speeding up cures for cancer. And you just hear about that. Users proactively come forward to us and share that. And when, you're, when that spreads throughout the community, it, it's, a, it's a very genuine electrification. Like everyone's like, wow, that's the potential of this. Let me dig in, let me, let me contribute more. Let me uh, teach my friend about how they can take advantage of this tech. And so um, it, it's, it's a very positive vibe that, that every new person who joins, they contribute their story, just keeps that flywheel going. And it's something you can't manufacture either. So again, if you're, if you're a founder or, or aspiring founder, um, it's not something you can just like, okay, let's now do community, right? You have to construct a product, a product architecture, interfaces, extension points that allow the community to contribute. You have to take those contributions and consider them authentically and originally and, and sincerely. Um, and you don't have to say yes to everything, but you have to have honest dialogue with the community in order to get that flyaway going. And once they see that, and once they see the value that they can contribute, it becomes part of their identity. You can't manufacture that. Um, and so I'd encourage you to really think deeply, again, about your, your intentional approach to folks outside your organization to get a, a very, can be a very compelling and powerful flywheel. I'm going to ask my last question. If you have a question, queue up at the mic. Uh, we're going to take a couple of questions. So if you have them, queue up, and I'll turn it over to the audience. The competition component. Docker's open source. I remember being at GCP, and it's like, we're just going to ship Docker. And if we can't ship Docker, we'll ship run C, right. right? And now you're like, man, I'm now competing with the giants. And you just talked about this healthy ecosystem balance of you want partners. Some of the partners contribute with some parts of the stack. How do you kind of like, hey, in order to be successful, that has to also be a thing. How do you manage that? No, that that's right. And it is, it is a, a delicate dance and one that's always evolving, right? Because the Tech is, is always abstracting and moving up the stack. Um, you have to be really clear. It goes back to intentionality. We talked about it around community. We talked about it in terms of drawing lines in terms of commercial and open source. And there's intentionality around partners. So what's, what's super important is being clear with what is your core thing in the mix 
and where you expect and how partners to participate. And you can communicate this, obviously, in discussions and forums, but your product architecture and the extension points on the product architecture will do a really good job of communicating that. And I got a lot of credit to Kubernetes. Kubernetes did a fantastic job of being really clear, like, hey, we're going to build out all these extension points for storage and networking and security. And around each one of those points, their own little SIG or special interest group spun up, and it, it became an, its own sub-community in and of itself. Um, but the Kubernetes team was very intentional about that, and, and the, result, you know, the results we see today, KubeCon and, and all the success around it. And so um, it's the clarity of your internal team first, knowing what you're about and where you're going and why, and then being intentional about exposing to partners what role you ask them to play. And then guess what? If you do that successfully, you and partners can go to your commercial customers and provide a unified front of like how you all benefit. They'll buy this from this partner, that from that partner, and everyone wins. If you're not clear about that, then you all get in and you start fighting in front of the customer and then it doesn't go well at all. So intentionality, I, I think, is a theme you've heard me repeat a couple of times, whether it's community, whether it's commercialization, or whether it's partnership and ecosystem, and it'll pay off in multiples in all those. I see some founders that should be standing at that mic. You literally should be standing at that mic. Uh, so we got a couple of questions queuing up. I'll ask one more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably put you in the hot seat. Because the, the one thing is that you actually have to make decisions sometimes. And the one controversial decision I remember Docker making was this thing called Moby. Right? Docker was the, every, people got the, some people got Docker tattoos with the well on it. And I remember you were like, hey, we're about to, yeah, we're about to split this thing. Open source is going to go over here to Moby. Docker's going to go over here with the trademarks and all the things. And a lot of people got confused. But you had to make a decision at that time. And, Sometimes you end up splitting the community. How do decisions like that get made? And then what's the retrospective on those decisions that influence how you think about the company and the product going forward? Yeah, yeah, no, it, boy, we could spend another hour, but the queue's getting longer. It, it, it gets to um, understand where your value is. And we understood that the value, a big part of the value in the product was the brand and the trademark and the user experience. I mean, the Docker run, Docker push, Docker pull, it is, is beloved worldwide for its simplicity and, and how it really simply stands up these abstractions that abstract the, the app from the underlying infrastructure. And so we decided to keep that in our own governance. That was Moby. Still Apache v2, still open source, but appreciating that the broader ecosystem could benefit from some of the core internals as part of that move, we then gave the core engine, Container D, to the Linux Foundation. And that was very intentional as well, because we did not want to split the market, right? So what happened in the Unix wars, all right? You know, HPUX, AIX, Solaris, maybe this is before some of you were born, but like, no, no, no Linux, no Unix app can run on another Unix platform. In the Linux market, we screwed this up as well, like Ubuntu, SUSE, Red Hat, like no Red Hat app can run on Ubuntu, right? Very proud of us as a community. You write a container image on Docker desktop, it can run on AWS EKS, it can run on Red Hat OpenShift unchanged. And that is because of some of these moves we made. We did not want to split the market. So long story short, we kept the branding in our own governance. We moved the core technology into Linux Foundation that everyone has now embraced. It is the default runtime for Kubernetes, container D. Okay? And, and as a result, we have a unified, coherent, consistent ecosystem where everything runs everywhere unchanged. So let me pause there. We can Good spend another more. Let's jump on the questions. Uh, introduce yourself, uh, make your statement, or ask your question. Okay, I'm Barton George. I think Docker is a fascinating study in leadership and how different leaders have come through at different times. Uh, I know Ben was brought in. I don't, and you're going to fill in some of the details, but he was brought in from a company and he ran it for a while. And then he was out, and I can't remember where the gentleman was from next. It was a big company. Steve Singh. Yeah, and then I don't know if there was someone between him and you. Rob Bearden. Okay, and so just how this happened with the personalities, with the business, and what it means to be, say, someone like yourself, I think is the only one who's been there from the beginning compared to the others. Is that correct? So I'd just be interested in, in how, that all, how that all went about. Yeah, well, there's probably not enough bourbon in the room to, to go through all of that, but... Um, Look, at companies at different stages, and this is also important, I think, in the context of this forum, which is startup founders and, and aspiring founders, there, there's, there's what a company needs at each stage of its life cycle. And that goes for the CEO, it goes for the leadership team, it goes for the board, it goes for the employees. And at each inflection point, 
it's very healthy to stand back and say, okay, where are we going next? And am I, is this team, are these employees, are we well positioned to go to that next? We, we use the metaphor of um, a mountaineering, right? And so mountaineering, if you're going on a big, if you're going to Everest, you know, base camp, camp one, camp two, each one of those is a completely different journey than the journey before and has different risks, different constraints, different needs, and different high highs when you get to base camp versus camp one, camp two. And so what we've done over the years, and I wish it sounded, I wish it played out this, this cleanly, it, it did not, but every inflection point, um, the board and management look around and say, okay, are we set top to bottom for this next stage of the journey? And that's what drives changes like the ones you referenced. So you know, one, one dumb thing that I've seen from Docker, some of the earlier people that left during one of those phases, to see them come back, yes. like it's really hard to come back and not necessarily pick up where you left off. You're coming back to the new vision and figuring that you're going to find a place in it. Introduce yourself, make your question, and we'll do a time check. Yeah. Howdy. Uh, my name is Zach Faulkner. I'm a senior software engineer currently at a Series C. Um, so first off, thank you for giving us Docker. Uh, it's really revolutionized how we build and deliver code. Uh, but my question is, so Docker seemed to have a, a period of rough times where the company wasn't sure what it was and was trying to do a lot of different things. And you, you said the solution there was to focus on fundamental, return to the fundamentals and, and do what you did well that the community loved. So how do you get buy-in from all the other factions in the business that are attached to the things that they've built to shift back to those fundamentals and to return to the thing that is successful? Yeah, and unfortunately, it's a fantastic question, Zach. Thank you. It, um, unfortunately, to make that severe a pivot, it takes crisis. And without getting into too much of the confidential details, but we were running out of money. We weren't growing we're at the rate we needed to grow to sustain the employee base we had. Um, and the competition was coming in hot, giving away a lot of stuff that we were charging money for. Um, and so it created a crisis around management and the board where it's like, we need to do something drastic and it needs to be so drastic that it's a wake up call for both the market to know that we're going somewhere different as well as the internal team, to your point, that we're going someplace different. And uh, you know, full disclosure, uh, you, cause you can't let everyone know you're going through these things when you, when you do these divestitures. Um, we had significant attrition that first year because there's a bunch of people who said, you know what, that's too much for me, I'm not, I'm not there. Kelsey's point, they've, many of them have come back, which I'm very pleased of, humbled by. Um, but it took a crisis to say, big 180 degree turn, we're going over here. Thank you. Thank you. I'm John, uh, just ditto with what Zach said, we work together. Um, in your opinion, what's the most important thing you learned about the open source business model that you would do differently if you were to do it again? Uh, first, and maybe this applies to a lot of life lessons, but look, approaching, approaching community and users with a high degree of curiosity and humility is really important. It's, and it's, it's tough as a founder, right? Because you need conviction. The world's telling you you're an idiot. You're, my wife told me, like, what, are you, what the hell are you doing like, sticking around with this thing? And, and so you need a deep sense of self and, and vision of where you're going. And yet, and yet, and this is where it gets difficult, right? Hold in your mind kind of curiosity, listening, humility, like, okay, we, we can learn a lot from the outside world. We can learn a lot from our users. And, and in doing so, um, you can get in front of some of these existential questions, which is like thinking ahead of time about how you're going to monetize, or at least have a thesis. It doesn't have to be fully vetted, doesn't have to be validated, but have a thesis. Um, because once you open source, it is really, we're seeing this in the last couple of years, it's really hard to flip the, flip the license model or go back and pull stuff back in and such. And so if I had to sum it up in one word, a high degree, well, maybe two words, a high degree of curiosity slash humility, that's one word, and a high degree of intentionality um, is, is what I would do differently. Like have a strategy. Sorry? Like, have, like having a strategy. That, that's all wrapped in the bundle of strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. This, this question, I think, also applies to like cloud providers working on Kubernetes internally at GCP. What do you put upstream? There's a part of this where you can't put everything you want upstream. There's this illusion that all the companies are hiding and hoarding all of the advanced enterprise tech. The truth is some communities do not want that enterprise stuff in these upstream repositories. You can imagine merging FIPS compliance into a thing where you can't even compile it anymore because you don't have the right libraries to do so. 
there is a conversation with the community because in many ways, if it's a true open source project, it kind of goes from your project to our project. And so there's a lot of decisions. And the last thing I'll say here is, one thing we used to advise a lot of people that were going to open source something, start proprietary and closed because you can always give away. That conversation of taking away is impossible, right? So just keep that in mind. Uh, we'll do these last two, and I think we're going to be at a stopping point. Hi, thank you so much for um, you know giving this talk. Uh, my name is Joseph. I work at Lambda Labs. I was just wondering um, the way that you talk about Docker. You really have like a deep love for the product and for what you've built. Um, you've had like many uh, position changes in the Docker company, like. Uh, SVP, uh, COO, CPO, and I was just wondering if your relationship uh, with those uh, position changes has changed with your attachment to Docker. How do you navigate practicing trust as a skill in others to make the best decision when you might be uh, abstracted away from you know the decision making process? Uh, yeah, how do you just practice that? Yeah, deep, deep topic, Joseph. I'll, I'll just share two. One is. Um, don't let the org chart get in your way. And so I do skips all over the company. Um, I hold open office hours that anyone can get on my calendar. Employee, individual contributor one, I see one starts tomorrow, they can get on my calendar. And so, and, and, and then you have to get to communicate that and let, let it be known that like, like no one is above title, role, function, tenure. There, there's no room, we have an open collaboration as one of our virtues. Under open collaboration, there's no room for hierarchy and, and BS like that. So. That, that's and it, and it's two way, right? So it helps the employees um, really believe and trust and and open up with the open collaboration. And honestly, it helps me get signal from all over the company, which I desperately need in order to help navigate and steer and serve serve the employees. So that's one. Two is um, I carve out time every week for what I call walking the store. That's not my phrase. I stole it from Bezos. But Bezos is famous for spending several hours or half a day every week, where he just clicks around on on Amazon site back in the day. And so I carve out time every week to get put my hands on product and use the product. And I write it up and I post it so people, people know when you know, I find this rough edge or this is really cool or ah, have we thought about that? And so between those two, um, really just staying close to everyone in the company regardless of title and tenure and staying close to the product has really helped serve me as a leader uh, in my organization. I'm gonna follow up to this question. How do you, like look, you're trying to always attract the best talent possible. There's a fine line between being too transparent, hey, we got two months left, you all should go find new jobs, to creating an inspiring situation where you present the opportunities. If we go execute well on this enterprise play, I remember something as simple as enterprises want to use enterprise laptop management tools. Yes. MDM. To, yeah, MDM. MDM. All of these tools are like, hey, we need that from you. And if you go to an engineer, it's like, I don't want to work on that. How do you as a leader inspire them to say, hey look, if you can execute on this expert opportunity, here's the material impact you get to have on the business. Yeah, maybe, maybe two thoughts on that. One is, um, and we, we brought this up before, but um, don't, don't send proxies to talk to customers. Most engineers want to see their product loved and used and benefiting others, benefiting the young customers, most. And so bring them to the customers. Have them sit and hear how the customer's desktop IT team is struggling to deploy your product onto you know, tens of thousands of laptops. Like, wow, I don't want that. You know, I love my product. I want to help that IT ops team succeed. And all of a sudden, like, whether it's MDM or whatnot, it's, like, it, it's not about the thing. It's not about the technology. It's about helping another human being who sincerely loves the product or wants to help their engineers use the product be successful. So that's a, that's a really important one, is, is don't, don't send proxies. Have, have your engineers go directly. Second is, I mean, nothing, nothing speaks like success. And so um, we are transparent with our financials on a monthly basis, and we show kind of by product line what's, what's, what's driving the ARR. And then we tie that back to, OK, individual teams that are responsible for that, that product line. It's like, hey, I contributed to that. I'm, I'm helping our company by driving that much ARR for my business. So you know, no proxies. and, and celebrate and, and be very intentional with uh, drawing lines to success. I'll tell you, as an engineer that has been in an environment where, even when I was at Puppet Labs when we were small, I remember when we started to talk about what parts of the thing we sell actually sell. 
And if you're an engineer, you're like, you know what? We should, I should probably stop complaining about why we're not spending more time over here. Nobody wants it. Maybe I can just take my, because you know, as an engineer, you're always asking yourself, where can I make the most impact? I hate this abstract feeling that performance reviews, I got to try to come up with something cool to say. Wouldn't it be dope that I can just look at the graph and it's like, I'm in that number. So this is real easy. It takes me five minutes to do performance reviews. Like, <laughs> you seen that number? That's me. I got work to do. You got the final question. No pressure, but make it good. <laughs> uh, so my question is not really related to Docker, but just organization in general. Uh, because I feel you would be most relevant because you have pivoted a lot. And that expertise, I want a lot of insight from that. So as an organization, how do you know a part of your organization is metaphorically stinking and then get that orthogonal view and change that? Even better, how do you know a part of your organization is started to stink because we don't want to change that very late at the stage when that part of organization is no more performing up to the mark? Rather, how do we, like, do you have an insight as to how can you preempt that thing that, hey, part of this organization is kind of deteriorating, and then I got to have that orthogonal view and change those things fundamentally, or something like that. Yeah, that it's, it's, a deep, it's a deep surface area, or wide surface area of discussion, but I'll offer three things. Um, one is, in a fast-growing market, and if you're a startup that's also growing quickly, there's no such thing as a static organization. Like, there's no such thing as the perfect organization, right? Because the market's changing, your understanding of your market, your customers are changing, and you have to internally change and grow to evolve with that. I mean, real specific example. So in 2019, we had about 60 people, and uh, we had no sales, and it was, it was a pure self-service product. And developers would just come up and swipe their credit card, and they'd, they'd get their license and be on their way. You know, jump forward, now over 600 people, and we've got 80,000 customers, and JP Morgan Chase doesn't want to buy 10,000 seats on a credit card, right? So we had, we had to hire a sales force, and we built out a whole set of features to serve those types of customers. And so we've had to change our organization to serve a customer base that we've grown into. And so I would just, I would just caution against the perfect organization, the perfect static. That's kind of point one. Um, point two is, this sounds trite, but, but again, entrepreneurs in the audience or aspiring entrepreneurs may, I'm sure, will appreciate this. You, you hear this all the time, and it sounds easy, but culture is really important. Culture is really important, and it was the first thing we focused on when we restarted the company in 2019. Because everyone's pissed off, right? We, we did a divestiture, we wiped out everyone's stock, they were all surprised. We said, okay, we get it, and you're right to be angry and frustrated and, and, and totally empathize with that. What do we want this place to be from a culture standpoint where you want to come in here, serve tens of millions of developers, and do the best work in your career? And it led to a lot of intense conversations about what do we want this culture to be? We, we, Instead of values, we came up with virtues, because virtues are in action, values are things that get left on a whiteboard somewhere. And, and so that came out of employee conversations, and those became real operating tenants of our business. We hire for them, we fire for them, um, we promote on them, we reward on them. And so employees just start using them in their day to day. And so it helps when, when execs or founders aren't in the room, it helps keep that cultural vibe real and, and, and active. And then third, this sounds, sounds obvious, but just be super, super rigorous and accountable with objectives you set and how teams are performing against them, not just teams, but individuals. And the more that's clear, uh, clear and transparent, then if, when you're running into org issues, it'll be obvious to many, to many that you just have to take action and, and, and keep making hard decisions to move forward. So that's what I'd offer. Just no, nothing static. Culture is ground zero and just be rigorous, clear, and transparent with your objectives and holding people accountable for those objectives. And when we say culture, there's a part in that life cycle where you go beyond hiring the people you know. You go beyond hiring the people from the community, like the people who have experience and contribu contribution, so they kind of know the culture. Then you start hiring people that no one knows. You start even hiring people that have never used the product before. They're just really great engineers, but they've never used it before. They don't understand the culture or the customer. And so when they get onboarded, sometimes there's this idea like let them start working on the stuff we can't get time to, that's why we hired them, and they skip the cultural part. Hey, I gotta let you use this for a moment. I gotta let you come spend time with the customer and understand the roadmap. 
why we built things this way. Because most people come in at that stage like, oh, this is all crap. We've got to rewrite all of this in Rust. <laughs> but you got to be careful with that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? So I think you, you just own that, but it's very explicit. And that's just the phase. A lot of startups just let go of hiring way too early when they get to the phase of hiring people they don't know and then wonder why the culture starts eroding. That's our time, Scott. I really appreciate the transparency. Uh, let's pick a big round of applause for Scott.